brought the noble truth to me. I see reality, and with these truths, the middle path I choose. The Dharma shines in me. I'll strive for freedom, for sweet release in me. The noble truth to me, I see reality, and with these truths, the middle path I choose. The Dharma shines in me. I'll strive for freedom. For sweet release in me, all craving seeds, and so I'm here to share all that I know. The Dharma in. The noble truth to me, I see reality, and with these truths, the middle path I choose. The Dharma shines in me. I'll strive for freedom. For sweet release in me, all craving seeds, and so I'm here to share all that I know. The Dharma in us grows. The noble truth to me, I see reality, and with these truths, the middle path I choose. The Dharma shines in me. I 
I'll invite Sister Rohini to share the screen. You can join her. Can you all hear me? Uh, Sister Jackie, can you allow Sister Rohini to share the screen? Sister Jackie, can you hear me? Can you share? Go ahead, go ahead. Okay, uh, Sister Rohini needs to share the screen. Good evening, everyone. Uh, happy Vesa. Thank you for joining us this evening on this Christ Sacred Day, the birth, enlightenment, and the Parinibbana of the Buddha. We are very thankful to all of you all for joining us this evening. And I will just uh, give you a brief on how we will run this uh, session today. I'll do a short introduction, then we will start, dive straight into our Dhamma sharing. Then we'll open up for question and answer. Then we will have the closing chant and sharing of merits by Venerable Dr. Karma. And then we will have a short thank you note and an invitation for you to our next session. With that, I would like to, uh, with that, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker this evening. She's ordained by Venerable Ken Chen Changu Renpoche in 200 in 2009 and she is a trained as a civil engineer and holds a PhD in environment and resource studies. She has worked in the field of conservation for almost a decade and coordinated several social development and sustainable livelihood projects for the indigenous communities around Asli under the small grants program by the United Nations Development Program and the United Nations Development Program um, facility, besides conducting high conservation value assessments. In recognition of a contribution to environment, conservation, and Buddhism, she received an Outstanding Woman in Buddhism Award in Bangkok, Thailand on 5th of March, 2010. She is a seasoned speaker, having delivered lectures on the environment, animal welfare, gender issues, Buddhism, and interfaith harmony in Malaysia, Vietnam, Thailand, and India. She's the Deputy Director of Education at the Vajrayana Buddhist Council of Malaysia and the Re Religious Advisor to the Malaysian Buddhist Consultative Council. She has authored two books on conservation and co-authored a book featuring a comparative study between Sikhism and Buddhism entitled Two Gurus, One Message. Currently, she is the Assistant Professor in the Development Studies at the School of Politics, History and International Relations, University of Nottingham, Kuala Lumpur. She is a meditation teacher focusing on mind training, 
calm abiding and insight med meditation. This evening, This evening, she will share with us the insights on how to apply the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path, the core teachings of the Buddha in our daily lives to conquer our fears, anxiety, and turn our sufferings into victory in health, relationships, and finances. I'm very honored to introduce to you Assistant Professor Venerable Dr. Karma Tashi Tedron to our session this evening. Venerable. Namo Buddhaya and uh, happy Vesak Day, everyone. Thank you, Sister Vinita, for the uh, very interesting introduction. So um, thank you so much to Tiratana uh, Sukha Dhamma School for inviting me. Yeah, so today is Vesak Day and I have been uh, giving Dhamma talks at uh, uh, Tiratana Sukha Dhamma School for a number of years now. So uh, so last year, because we were in the midst of a pandemic, uh, very, I mean, not that we are not this year, but last year we were not very uh, Zoom savvy. This year we are. So here I'm back again after uh, a year of absence and I'm very happy to be able to join you on this very auspicious day of the Buddha's uh, birth, enlightenment and Mahaparinirvana, meaning the passing away of the Buddha. So there are three uh, things that we are actually celebrating today, three occasions. So it's a very, 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 very important day and I cannot express how important it is to uh, the entire world. To me personally, um, this day is the single most important day in the history of uh, the world because this is the day when uh, the light of the world, the light of Asia, the light of the world uh, revealed the knowledge of uh, reality. Before uh, the Buddha came into this world, obviously there were many gurus, rishis, munis and everything. But uh, I will explain to you uh, what is the difference between the enlightenment of a Buddha and, and the samadhis of uh, the rishis, munis in the past. Yeah? So um, with great respect, obviously all these uh, great thinkers, great seers, all of them have their place in humanity. But the Buddha was an enlightened being par excellence. Yeah? So um, the reason why I'm saying this is because uh, the Buddha actually discovered some truths which uh, was not discovered prior to his coming into this world. Uh, and only once uh, in a couple of aeons, a few aeons, does a Buddha come a fully enlightened being. That means a Samyak Sambuddha. A Samyak Sambuddha is one who is not just merely enlightened, like uh, attain Nirvana, like Arhans, but he has gone through three aeons of continuous training, life after life, coming back again and again and again and again to help sentient beings. So this is the uh, reason why the Buddha is uh, celebrated because of his uh, sacrifice. Three aeons is a very, very long time. Yeah, Three days for us is also quite long. One year staying in lockdown is very, very long. Uh, and imagine uh, we have to sacrifice our freedom for one year, one and a half years. Uh, and then uh, we think that that is a very long span of time. But in reality, um, this is nothing compared to uh, the suffering that we have endured in samsara. Samsara means this cycle of births and deaths. So um, if we are not, if we don't subscribe to the idea of births and deaths, you know, like uh, karma, rebirth, uh, and then, um, you know, yeah. So then it doesn't really matter because the teachings of the Buddha is applicable to all beings, whether or not you believe in it or not. So, um, May I share the screen, Sister Vinita? Uh, go ahead, go ahead. Yes, Raven. So, okay. Yes, thank you, Jackie. Sister Jackie, thank you so much. So, the title of my uh, Dhamma sharing today is um, How to Turn Your Suffering into Victory. <laughs> so, it, the theme is very interesting because um, the historical Buddha, Siddharth Gautam Buddha, he turned his suffering into victory and not only his own suffering but he also gave all sentient beings a path out of suffering it's not that the buddha is going to transfer his realizations to us you know or water us with uh, his uh, energy of enlightenment and then all of us become enlightened instantly that's not what enlightenment is about and that's not what enlightened beings do if that were the case then all of us would be enlightened by now and the samsara would be completely empty that is not the the idea of uh, dharma practice or enlightenment. Enlightenment meaning that through one's own effort, that means you have to make the effort. But in order for you to 
do something, you actually need to know what you're doing. So the problem is that before the Buddha came into this world, beings, they were trying to figure out like uh, sort of like shooting in the dark. Um, maybe this way is right. Maybe that, that way is right. You know, so uh, they tried various means and they achieved very high levels of concentration, samadhi very high levels of jhana, but they still could not come out from this vicious cycle of samsara, which I'll explain to you very shortly. So samsara is the cycle of births and deaths, the cycle of suffering, the cycle which we are trapped in. Yeah? So we all living beings, all sentient beings, sentient beings means that any uh, living being with a degree of sentience, somebody who's able to um, cognize even a little bit, feel uh, pain, not plants feel pain too, but they're not really categorized as uh, sentient beings. Fenton beings. Sentient beings are those that have an ability to cognize. I'll bet no matter how small, but they still have the ability to cognize. They, they, they are aware, they know what's going on and, and, and they, they, they feel that they, and they move and they try to do something about it. So these are sentient beings. So we have been trapped for, for a long, long, long period of time. So when I say that the Buddha has been around for three aeons, aeons, it's an incalculable uh, a period of time. That means Prince Siddhartha in his last birth, before that he had many, many, numerous, 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 numerous births. So three aeons before he became enlightened, he was um, an ascetic named Sumedha. And during the time of uh, Buddha Dipankar, Buddha Dipankara was uh, the Buddha of that time three aeons ago. And the ascetic Sumedha uh, really, really revered uh, the Buddha. Buddha Dipankara. So one day when the Buddha Dipankara was passing by uh, in uh, the locality where Ascetic Sumedha was staying, and then he saw that there was a lot of mud. And then Ascetic Sumedha said, oh no, what am I going to do? So the, the Buddha's uh, robes are going to be soiled. And then there behind him are 500 Arhans. Arhans meaning that uh, those who have followed the path of the Buddha, but they have not become fully enlightened beings, but they have uh, managed to come out of samsara. Yeah, so there is a difference. I'll explain it later. If I forget, ask me during the question and answer session. So, uh, Ascetic Sumedha actually put his body, like he, he became the bridge on top of the mud for Buddha Dipankara to, and his entourage to uh, cross over to the other side. And then Ascetic Sumedha was joyful. And what he said was, he, he requested the Buddha to please uh, give me a definite prediction that I would like to become enlightened, but Will I become enlightened in the future or will I not? And then uh, Buddha Dipankara put his hand on uh, Ascetic Sumedha's head and then he said, you will become a Buddha three aeons from now in such and such a world system, in such and such a place and having the name, a uh, family name of Gautama and you will be reborn in the Sakya clan. So that means that uh, three aeons, <laughs> so for those of us three days, we cannot, do, we cannot even stand three days of suffering and uh, you know helping others. So Ascetic Sumedha said, he was so joyful, he said, yes, from today onwards, I make the vow that I'm going to come back life after life in order to help sentient beings. So that means each life he came back in various forms, be it a bird, uh, a monkey king, a bird, uh, uh, whatever, you know, so many, many, many different uh, animals, yeah, uh, lion king, so many, many different animals and humans and uh, different life forms. Uh, and then he came in order to, um, you know, to increase his uh, merits and also to help sentient beings. Along the way, he sacrificed himself, he sacrificed his body many times, he sacrificed his wealth and everything along the way. So all of us here, like we donate about two ringgit, we feel like we're proud of ourselves, right? So it's like the, the Bodhisattva uh, Sumedha, like uh, for uh, Prince Siddhartha in his previous lives, he was uh, Sumedha and many, many other uh, life forms. He came back time and time again for what purpose? In order for him to establish connections with all beings so that by the time he comes to the last birth here, he would have created such affinities where he'll be able to uh, guide sentient beings very, very easily. So after three long aeons, finally he took birth in this world system in, and he was born in uh, Lumbini, the uh, present day Nepal. And he was born in Lumbini and then uh, into a uh, Sakya family. His father's name was Shudodana, King Shudodana, and mother's name was Maya Devi. And King Shudodana wanted uh, the Buddha, sorry, his son, Prince Siddhartha, to become uh, a, a universal monarch, Chakravati Samrat. But 
Prince Siddhartha was not interested because he knew that his destiny, after three aeons, you, you come, you sweat, you know, you have your blood, sweat and tears after three aeons. And then you come into this life just to become a, a, a king all over again and go into samsara all over again. He said, I don't think so. He said, this life, I would like to be a Buddha. This is the destiny that I'm meant to fulfill from my own actions. So in Buddhism, we do not actually subscribe to uh, destiny. We say that one creates our own destiny. Your destiny is not written in the sky somewhere. And we do not uh, subscribe to the idea that there's a creator God sitting somewhere, whether it is up on the throne or wherever, uh, writing people's um, sentient beings. Uh, kismet, how, how do I say? Kismet is uh, your fate, yeah? so your destiny. Your destiny is not written in the sky. So we write our own destiny and wherever we are today, in whichever place that we are, whichever situation that we are, whether happiness, suffering, it's all because of what we have written in this life and past life through our karmic actions. So before that, um, yeah, so uh, happy Vesa. <laughs> so this is Siddharth Gautam Bud. So for those of you who do not know, uh, so now let me just introduce a little bit about what the Buddha actually thought. The Buddha actually never intended to have a religion. So today we are all bickering about religions. In fact, whenever I give any Dharma teachings, I, even though I'm a, I'm a monastic, yeah, I am dressed a certain way, I do not have any hair, uh, you know, I, I am actually uh, representing uh, the Buddha's Sangha. But, 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 the thing is just that uh, the Buddha never actually intended to have organized religion in such a way that we believe today. So meaning that every religion is tightly, uh, you know, it's like it has the scriptures and then after that only the scriptures matter and those who follow the scriptures, uh, they, they belong to a particular prophet and those who do not follow, they are like non-believers. So in Buddhism, they, we do not subscribe to these dualistic ideas of believers, non-believers. Anyone is welcome. In fact, the day that the Buddha became enlightened, he, he actually discovered the the truths, yeah, the reality of the world. So now just think about it. Uh, we learn physics in school, we learn biology, chemistry, and many other things, yeah, especially the sciences. We learn the sciences in school. And uh, and it doesn't matter whether we are Buddhist, we are uh, Hindu, Sikh, Muslim, Christians, or anything like that. All of us can go to school, all of us can learn physics, chemistry, and 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 still we keep our respective faith intact, isn't it? Right? So in the same way, actually, the Buddha intended for uh, his teachings to be something like physics, biology, chemistry. For you to learn and for you to understand the way reality works. And the, the science that the Buddha taught is called the science of mind. It's actually a psychology. It's a mind, it's a man, mind training. So you don't have to be Buddhist. You don't have to worry, oh, if I listen to the Buddha's teachings, you know, I might get converted and then, 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 then that's, that's the end of me. That's not true. Just because I'm a monastic in the Buddhist tradition, it does not mean that I have actually, uh, you know, uh, thrown away my birth religion or anything of that sort. It, that is not the case. We don't have to, I treat this in the same way as I would learn biology or chemistry. One's roots does not one does not uproot one's roots just because you learn a science. So this is the introduction I want to give to my uh, friends and family members from uh, various different religious traditions, beautiful spiritual traditions in this world. So the Buddha merely taught how to live a good life in accordance with the laws of the universe, which he discovered through his own effort over a period of three aeons, culminating in his last life as Prince Siddhartha and during the night of enlightenment, the night before his enlightenment, the Buddha discovered three things. During the first watch of the night, the Buddha discovered what? Who knows? During the first watch of the night, the Buddha discovered his limitless past lives that he has lived. And this is not, so this is the reason why we say that the Buddha, uh, whatever that he discovered is from his own experience. He did not like um, just hear from somebody else and then just uh, parrot it back again to somebody else. Whatever that the Buddha discovered was through his own experience, Anubhav. So his own Anubhav, his experience, tells him that this is the case. So during the first watch of the night, he discovered all his previous lifetimes beginning since beginningless lives. And then the second watch of the night, the Buddha saw how sentient beings, uh, you know, 
uh, pass away and then, you know, uh, the round of rebirths, how they actually pass away and then they're reborn according to the karma. So this is very, very important. So um, during the third watch of the night, I forgot now, what was the third watch of the night? Uh, I can't remember. But, uh, but the Buddha discovered the Four Noble Truths and then the Noble Eightfold Path. So meaning that the Buddha actually discovered what is already in the universe. It's not that the Buddha created something new. It's just, it's not that nobody else could have discovered, but it just so happened that the Buddha put in so much effort to discover it for himself. And then after that, he decided to share it with us. Pretty much the same as Isaac Newton. Sir Isaac Newton, he was uh, sitting under a tree, isn't it? And then he saw uh, the apple falling from a tree, correct? And then Sir Isaac Newton said that, ah, this shows that there is gravity, the law of gravity exists because the law of gravity is not visible to the naked eye. But obviously we can feel the law of gravity and we are subject to the law of gravity. In the same way, the Buddha said that uh, even though you cannot see the law of karma cause and effect, even though you cannot see that you're trapped in samsara, you cannot see the law of interdependence, you cannot see the four noble truths, it does not mean that it's not there, right? In the Four Noble Truths, you can see it in, 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 in some ways, but there are some that ways you cannot see it unless you are told. So it's like if you're told and if you're taught, then you say, oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Otherwise, we will think that life is a bit of roses, isn't it? So today, you asked me to talk about sharing with you about relationships, how to have relationships, how to be healthy, and how to have uh, you know financial stability, something to that effect, isn't it? I will answer all three questions in one go. And, and, the, and the tool that I'm going to use is called the wheel of becoming. So before you try to, to you know, uh, talk about relationships, health and everything, I would like to, you know, um, I would like to share with you what the Buddha, the essence of the Buddha's teaching. The Buddha said that what you think is what you get. So you, th you think you are what you think. So what you think you become, what you feel you attract and what you imagine you create. So be very careful. So the Buddha in the Dhammapada was uh, number one, he said that mind is the forerunner. That means everything in this world, whatever that you do, it first manifests in the mind. And then you'll ask me what's mind. Mind and thought are not the same thing. Mind is an innate awareness, an innate awareness which uh, beings in this world, many uh, spiritual traditions, some call it uh, the divine energy inside you, some call it uh, the Buddha nature, some call it the true nature of mind, some call it Nam, you know, some call it Vahiguru, some call it Brahma, you know, anything, you can call it whatever you want. But the essence of it is that it's like a clear sky on a beautiful day, it's a clear sky and the beautiful sun is, is shining and you can see that beautiful sky and you feel joyful. The nature of our true, our true nature of mind, our mind, our innate awareness is the same. It's vast, it's pure, it's joyful, it's, it's so vast, it's clear, it's calm, it has the quality of compassion, kindness, you know. So people, like uh, if we study psychology, for example, criminology, uh, like we will say that uh, human beings are born evil. There is a school of thought which says that human beings are born evil. We need to train them like Hobbes, for example. Hobbes said that all, all uh, human beings are actually inherently despicable and we need, they need to be trained, you know. So we, there has to be some sort of uh, external power to actually um, uh, sort people out. So we have countries' laws, we have uh, laws, we have got what police, we have got the army, we have got... Uh, Every kind of policing because human beings are despicable and we are unruly and we are beasts, beast-like. So uh, that's our innate nature according to Hobbes. But Locke said, no, human beings are inherently good. So if all they need is some motivation. And then Hobbes said, nah, it's not true. Human beings are actually inherently wretched. Yeah? <laughs> so, that, so now the Locke's the, uh, attitude, yeah, uh, his um, conception of the human being is very close to um, the Buddha. So the Buddha said that there's no human being or there's no sentient being who is despicable. That's number one. So some people say that, okay, all beings come into the world with a clean sheet, clean slate, and then after that, uh, from there, we start, uh, you know, 
being bombarded by all sorts of ideas and then we become rotten, <laughs> corrupted to the bone. Yeah, In a way, it's true, but not really true also. In a way, you know, there are some actually really incorrigible children when they are born itself, they start killing ants and, and animals and stuff like that. Yeah, so where, so can all children, you know, all babies that are born, you know, immediately, can we say that all of them are innocent, 100% innocent? Or some of them do have that innate, uh, we say, we say innate, yeah, but actually it's not true. But they have those tendencies, I wouldn't say innate, they have tendencies of violence more than others. Some children, when they are born, they have tendencies of goodness, kindness, calm, compassion. Whereas some children, incorrigible to the bone, you know, they 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 they, they are so destructive, you know. And and even if they have very very good parents, also some children are very very destructive. How is this possible? It's possible because we actually have lived before. We have lived before, and and we have lived, and that okay. Many of us do not subscribe to the idea of karma and rebirth. That's fine, yeah? Okay, so, but the thing is just that we have to understand if there is no karma and rebirth, then where did these tendencies actually come from? So an all-benevolent creator, God could not have actually infused uh, wretchedness and, and, and uh, evil into one and then goodness into another. That would seem very unfair, isn't it? There has to be another explanation. The explanation is that karma and rebirth is is the, the main explanation because we have lived before and how we lived in our previous lives actually makes our character today. So here it says that what you think you become. So whatever that we have been thinking since beginningless time, so there is no first cause that created us. And then we can say that, oh, this is our first birth. And it is our second and third, fourth birth. It doesn't work like this. We actually, we have incalculable, limitless lifetimes that we have lived. So we cannot actually go back to the first point. Yeah. So the Buddha actually cautioned us against going back to the first point. He said, why do you need to know? He, he may have probably seen it. Yeah, I'm not sure. But then again, according to the law of dependent origination, you, there is, you cannot find a first cause because everything is interrelated. So that's why the Buddha said that there are 14 questions you should not ask because it's time waste, you know. Uh, like for example, what happens to Buddha after the Buddha passes away? And then uh, where did we come from? How did we, we first come into this universe? You know, when was our first birth and all these kinds of things? The Buddha said that it's like asking uh, somebody who has been pierced by an arrow, a poison arrow, who shot the arrow? What was his caste? What is his age? What is his name? Which uh, 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 village does he come from? You know, what is the arrow made of? By the time somebody gives the answers to these questions, that person would have been uh, would have already died of arrow of poisoning and bleeding. So the Buddha said that be wise, you know, no need to speculate about metaphysical questions. Do the needful, try to tame your mind in this in this lifetime itself, because our lifetime is very short. Only in the human realm can we actually train our minds to the highest degree. We cannot possibly be, re when we are reborn as an animal, we cannot possibly train our minds. We may be able to parrot some verses, some chants, you know, but that does not mean that the parrot or whichever animal that is parroting it actually understands uh, the content. But human beings understand it and we have the capacity to attain enlightenment in this very lifetime. So we have to be very careful of what we think because what we think manifests into speech and action. And where does thoughts come from? Thoughts come from, from ignorance. So we have innate ignorance, which I'm going to explain to you later. But first, the question of mind, I'll come back to it. The Buddha said that we are neither born evil nor are we actually born uh, very good. We are actually subject to our karma. So whichever karmas that we have brought in from the previous lifetimes, that is what we will manifest. But underneath all, actually, these are just like uh, dark clouds blocking a beautiful clear sky. Our negative karmas, our afflictive emotions, our negative emotions, these things, you know, like anger, hatred, hatred jealousy, pride, all these things are just adventitious, uh, you know, stains on our innate awareness. Our innate awareness is like the sky. So on, on a cloudy day, clouds come and then they obscure the sun and then, and then the mood is very gloomy. We get the blues and all. But it does not stay there forever. When the rain comes and then after that, the, the sky clears. In the same way, our defilements, our negativities are obscuring our sky-like nature of mind. 
that's our, our true nature of mind actually is pristine, pure, clear. We are of the nature of goodness, like what Locke said, yeah? John Locke was correct and Thomas Hobbes was not, yeah? <laughs> so, um, so now we look at the wheel of becoming. So very quickly, I just want to give you the essence. So if you look here, the wheel of becoming, we call it Bhava Chakra. Bhava Chakra means that how we actually came into this world and, and, how we, and what has that got to do with our relationships, finance and health? Let me explain first, okay? So you look at this particular, uh, this inner core. This inner core of the Bhava Chakra consists of three animals. The first animal is a pig. The pig represents ignorance. And the second, uh, the, sorry, uh, yeah. Actually, the pig, the, the snake and the rooster, the chicken, we call it rooster. The pig represents ignorance. The rooster represents attachment, isn't it? And then the snake represents uh, what? Hatred. So these are the mental poisons. And this is the inner core of the Bhava Chakra, the wheel of existence, we call it. We are in this particular Bhava Chakra because we have these three that are obscuring our sky-like nature of mind. So you see the Buddha is outside here. Yeah, and enlightened beings all are outside here. So this is Yamraj. This is actually the Lord of Death. The Lord of Death has us all trapped inside this and all of us, every single living being, unless we have become Arhans or we have become Buddhas, we, have, we, have, we are still trapped in this. No matter where we take birth and no matter which religion we are, we are still all inside this. So there is this black shade and then this white shade. So this black shade, if you can see clearly, these are actually the woeful realms. So in Buddhist cosmology, we say that they are, there's a hell realm, there is a uh, animal realm, there's a preta realm, peta, yeah, we call it peta. And then also we have, uh, in uh, Theravada Buddhism, we say the asura is also actually the, uh, the lower realms. Yeah? So we have these lower realms, which is actually the dark meaning when we create negative karma because of ignorance. Ignorance fuels hatred and attachment. So because of ignorance, it, hatred and attachment, we create negative karmas and negative karmas, the end result of it that we have hellish states of mind. And when we have hellish states of mind, greed, greedy state of mind, then we fall down into the hell. So for those who do not actually subscribe to the idea of hell, heaven, anywhere other than this earth, it's the, it doesn't matter. We can still apply this here. So the white portion here, the white portion here is actually talking about whatever good that we have done. So it, once we actually do good, that means we are not actually under the power of these three, then we start to become higher and higher in our thinking. So each day when we actually eliminate our ignorance, we eliminate our uh, anger, we eliminate our attachment, each day then we go higher and higher. So we are actually like born in the uh, human realm where we can actually come back and we can do Dharma practice. But this, even humans are here too, actually, you know, can those who are in very despicable um, circumstances, they are actually here too in the lower realms, yeah? Because they do not have a pre precious human rebirth. For those who have a precious human rebirth, that's too much for me to talk today. Those who have precious human rebirth, that means they have all the necessary conditions and the faculties of mind in order to be able to uh, train the mind to the highest level. These are belonging to the left-hand side, the white colors. Okay, so I can't explain too much of the Bhava Chakra to you, but I just want you to know that uh, the, the Bhava Chakra, I just wanted, because I only have one hour, if I have two hours, I'll explain the entire Bhava Chakra to you. But this Bhava Chakra is very, very important because it shows that we are trapped because of our negative emotions. That is the core. So because of the negative emotions, whatever, how we think results in where we are going to be born in our circumstances, right? So um, we cannot actually see here. So it's very difficult for me to show you here. So I show you a different diagram. I show you something called dependent origination. Now, the pick was actually the ignorance, right? Right. So the dependent origination was what the Buddha taught uh, sentient beings. And this actually is a defining... Uh, 
teaching of Buddhism. The other uh, spiritual, beautiful spiritual traditions in this world may have it embedded here and there, but not in the way that the Buddha described it. So before I teach you this uh, dependent origination, I would like you to actually look at the Four Noble Truths. Well, we come into this world, we come into relationships, we come into financial difficulty uh, and health, uh, all these. All these things actually, uh, sorry, there's somebody at the door. That's why I'm a little bit distracted. It must be my Lazada order, I think. I ordered some shields. Yeah. Or it could be my cat just uh, just scratching and then uh, uh, making as if there's a knock. Is it my cat? Oh yeah, it's Baba. Yeah, okay. So, I'm <laughs> so when the Buddha was enlightened, which is on this day, 2,600 years ago, yeah, 2565 to be exact. I do not know. Actually, the dates are very disputable. Yeah, So I cannot say that it's 2565. Yeah, just roughly 2,600 years ago. So the Buddha discovered that life is actually suffering. So for those of you who think that, you know, you're in relationships and everything, uh, and it's like, a, oh, I'm in one relationship, I'm suffering. Then you go to another relationship, you also suffer. And then you go to a third relationship, there's more suffering, or maybe less. But suffering is always there, isn't it? Some partner may be uh, very understanding, some partner may be very lazy, some, some may be very, very uh, attractive, but some may be, you know, very plain looking, and some... Some may be actually very uh, supportive and some may be very selfish. So, you know, so depending on your karma, this is the kind of uh, condition partners that you can get. Okay, so what, what do we do about it? So the first thing is that when life challenges you, when you have got like financial difficulty, for example, like now we are in this world now where we have a tremendous amount of suffering due to the COVID-19 pandemic. How do we actually come about? How do we actually get this suffering? We got this suffering because not because the skies and the moon actually decided our fate and not the planetary alignments, but because of our ignorance. Our ignorance and our three mental poisons, ignorance generates attachment and attachment generates hatred. So we like something, we, that is attachment. We don't like something, we push. So that creates karmas, you see. So this is the reason why we are suffering. So the first thing is in your relationship, wherever you are in this, in this life, whether you have good health, good relationship, uh, good finances, or bad health, bad relationship, bad finances, you have to understand one thing, that life is suffering. Anytime your circumstances can change. So if your finances are low today, it's never going to be this. It's not going to be this permanently because the Buddha said that life is impermanent also. So there are three things, three characteristics that the Buddha taught. Impermanence, suffering, and non-self. So impermanence is, is a characteristic. So this COVID-19 is not going to be around forever. It, it may be around for a long, long period of time, but not forever. And you can be poor or financially constrained for tremendous amounts of time, but not forever. And you may have a very nice uh, partner or very good health, not for long, it cannot be forever because one day we have to separate from our partner and we have to die also. So no one said that life is a bit of roses. So the first thing is the Buddha said that before you all complain, let me tell you what is, what is the truth. Before you all complain about your life circumstances, now let me just tell you that life is not a bit of roses, aka life has inevitable suffering. Suffering is everywhere, yeah? So if you come into this world thinking that life is actually very beautiful, but uh, somehow either... Uh, our life is full of suffering. Other people's lives are very nice. That's not true. People's lives are actually quite miserable also. Every living being in this world, anybody comes into this world, a sentient being, will suffer because there is no way that anyone who is born will not die. That's suffering too. There's no way that anyone who is born will not become old. There's no way that anyone who is born will not become sick. So you can see this from your own uh experience so wherever that you are wherever you go you can see aging you can see death you can see sickness so if suddenly somebody says that a person is sick oh yo, that person is sick what's so um actually surprising about being sick because the contract was that when we came into this world we should know that actually life is suffering so if we come into this world thinking that my everybody's lives are fantastic only mine is suffering well check again that is actually our fundamental flawed perception. 
So we, we, we moan and groan and thinking that only our lives are miserable, other people's lives are nice. Don't compare. Because actually we do not know what other people are suffering. How, what kind of battles they are fighting, we don't know. So then, so the Buddha said that stop thinking that this is utopia. There is no utopia. Because look at the Bawa Chakra. How, what kind of a utopia is this? You know, when you when you are full of mental poisons, you end up in the black range. If you have if you have lesser mental poisons, you end up in the white range, but you're still stuck. Until and unless you uproot ignorance from your mind stream, you are going to be stuck and recycled time and time again in this samsara. Only if you have uprooted yeah, the mental defilement of ignorance, then you are enlightened like the Buddha. So this is why the Buddha is like extremely, extremely uh qualified to teach us the Four Noble Truths, the Noble Eightfold Paths and all these things. So the Buddha, this is what the Buddha discovered during his night of enlightenment. Life is suffering, okay? And then there is a cause to our suffering. So for those of you who may not be able to understand uh, much about uh, English, so it's like, number one, we say that uh, sansar is actually suffering. Sansar means duk hai. And number two, duk ka kya karan hai. So it's like, what is the... Uh, cause of our suffering. Number three is Dukkha Nivaran. There is a, an end to suffering. An end of suffering is there. So if there is only, okay, the Buddha said that the first two is a bit depressing, like, you know, life is suffering, so, you know, get over it. And then number two is like, you, you need to know what is the cause of suffering. And the cause of suffering, the Buddha said, is none other than us. We can't blame God. We can't blame the devas, the, the brahmas, the, the stars, the moons, you know, brother, sister, father, mother. Some people blame their parents. It's because of you, I came into this world and then now I'm suffering. Well, actually, you wanted to come into this world. You created the causes and conditions to come into this world. So that's why your parents were just a medium. You had to come somewhere, somehow, through your own karma. So who is actually the cause of our suffering? Us. So never ever blame God or never ever blame anyone, uh, the Buddha, whoever it is, it's just us. So whatever that we are suffering today, the COVID-19 pandemic, everything, it's us, nothing else but us. And then the Buddha said that, okay, if you know the cause of suffering is yourself, and what do we mean by yourself? It means that we have this mental defilement, latent defilement called ignorance. But we can't see ignorance. Ignorance is very abstract. So Ignorance means that we are not aware of what's going on. We are not aware. We are in an automatic mode all the time. We are not aware that we are breathing. We are not aware that we are eating. We are not aware of our thoughts. We just go about automatic mode day in and day out, just do, doing mundane things and then going through the motions of daily life. And then we wind up dead after 70 years, if you're lucky. Maybe after 20 years, if you're unlucky. Or maybe after immediately when we are born, if you're extremely unlucky, then we can die anytime. So no one said that we are not going to die. So now the COVID-19 is that all those have unfortunately, you know, died. One day, we are also going to die. It's not that they have gone and we are going to stay. It's not like that, yeah? We are going to die too. Buddha said that it's us who caused this suffering and it's because of ignorance. But this ignorance of what? We have this tendency to want to grab things that we like and then push things that we don't like. So this is the reason why we are suffering. Buddha said desire is the cause of suffering, right? The chicken, yeah. So Buddha said, okay, if there is an end to suffering, don't worry, by this time, by number one and two, you're already very miserable, almost like, you know, like in despair. Buddha said, hold on a second, there is an end to suffering. This is called the noble truth of the cessation of suffering. And then the fourth, that there is a, uh, there's a the end to suffering is the noble eightfold path. Yeah. So what is the Noble Eightfold Path? I'm not going to really go through it because I do not have too much time today. So the Noble Eightfold Path is actually uh, divided into three. It's actually basic discipline, morality, and then samadhi, concentration, and then wisdom. So we have, uh, for example, uh, right mindful, right view, right intention. Yeah. These two are coming under Sorry, let me let me let me let me go from here. So here, right speech, right action, right livelihood. Yeah. So these actually these three are under the sila. Sila meaning ethics. So we have to keep our basic morality. So you see your relationships. You know, you wonder why your relationships sometimes go wrong. Are you actually very truthful with your partner? Or are you flirting around with someone else, you know, and then you're creating the causes? Or if, for example, like in this life, uh, one's partner actually uh, 
is cheating on one on you, even though you did not do anything in this life, you must understand that you have lived before. So definitely, uh, whatever that you did in the past, what goes around comes around. So in this life, you may get the repercussions of your actions from a period, previous life, even though this life you have been very, very good. And that's, therefore, you become very miserable. You say that I did not do anything to deserve this. Well, just because you can't see your past life and you can't see your karma does not mean that you did not do anything not to deserve this. Right? So because there's no, you do not, karma is very fair. You don't get what you don't deserve. I'm sorry to say, yeah, but it's true. Yeah? So I, I get a lot of health issues from, from time to time. I deserve it because of my mental culture. Yeah? So I take a lot of stress from work sometimes and then I get asthma attacks and this and that. Uh, so, you know, it's the way I think. So it's like work many hours a day and I never rest and everything like that. And then after that, uh, I don't have much time for uh, unwinding and then doing uh, meditation sometimes. Yeah? So some, and this sometimes is, even one week without meditation is bad enough to actually create bad health. Okay? So, right effort, right concentration, and right mindfulness is the second training. We call it the training in concentration. Training is samadhi. So, we need to daily unwind. We need to unwind and we need to rest our minds and then only we can think clearly as to what to do what not to do but if we do not keep our basic morality that means if we go around killing stealing having sexual misconduct lying harsh speech gossiping uh, and then having substance abuse we are not going to be very successful in our uh, samadhi practice so in buddhism uh, the laity those, I wouldn't say in Buddhism, the Buddha thought, okay, let's forget about the word Buddhism. This is applicable to all of humanity because this is like a subject called chemistry, biology. So it just so happens that it's a subject called Buddhism. But let me just say it's a subject called Buddha's teachings. Okay. So the Buddha said that you have to keep your, you have to stop killing. No matter how small a life, you must stop killing. If you want your life to be long, you have to stop killing. Right, And if you want good health, you have to stop killing. Number two, if you want to have a lot of money, you want to be, uh, you know, you want to have a lot of uh, uh, wealth, then stop stealing. <laughs> that means don't, don't be, uh, you know, it's like corruption is very, uh, you know, uh, endemic in many countries, you know. So, uh, so some people say, ah, you know, if you can't beat them, join them. Ah, ah, ah. If the moment you join them, you're creating the causes to become poor in this life and the next life also, and the future, future lives, many, many more. Think before you do, yeah? So don't steal. Some people say, I don't blatantly steal. But then again, we are also involved in bribing policemen here and there when we sum up, you know, when someone, nah, 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 take lah, 50 ringgit, something like that. That's actually perpetuating this corruption. And corruption is actually stealing. Because you're taking away somebody's right and you're taking away uh, the, the rule of law. So actually, you're actually stealing. And stealing cannot actually give you wealth. So if you're wondering how to actually be victorious and get good health, I mean, good wealth, stop stealing. You know, always be honest to the bone. Never ever cheat. Not a single cent. Okay, number three, if you want to have good relationships, you also have to be truthful. Truthfulness is the number one, the basis of any relationship. So if you're not truthful, if you tell lies, and then if you like, you know, go around cheating and two timing, then it's no wonder that you know, it, okay, you say this life you don't do, but in the past you may have done. So if in this life you don't do, very good for you. But uh, you know, but if in this life you do, then next life will be unfortunately not so good for you. Think of it like that. So we always have to accept wherever that we are now. Number one in the framework of the four noble truths we are here in this uh, samsara this is not a bed of roses samsara is a very terrible place to live in so we have to be we have to know where our starting point is so what to do what to do is keep your basic morality don't kill don't cause to kill don't steal don't uh, have this uh, sexual misconduct affairs and this and that and then uh, tell the truth always always be truthful no matter how, no matter how you know tantalizing it is tempting for you to tell lies some people they, they really don't think twice because it's so ingrained in them that they can just lie through their teeth but that's then you if you have and some people lie through their teeth and never think about it because they never have they are actually perpetuated by ignorance and ignorance is a very very heavy mental fog that does not allow you to see your thought processes so when you can't see what you're doing and you and you have been habituated to doing it many many times so guess what every life you will be actually lying gossiping, having uh, 
you know, uh, just um, slandering people, harsh speech, and then uh, idle talk. So this is the fourth precept is actually keeping your speech pure. Number five is refraining from alcohol, uh, drugs, glue sniffing, vaping, uh, all these kinds of things. At all And also social media, so anything that's addictive. So the fifth precept actually means anything and everything that is addictive. Pornography, yeah, anything, yeah. Games that you know, so if you know that the game is you're going to be absorbed in the game, stop it. If you know that the Facebook is going to take up a bulk of your time and ruin you, and then you know, at the expense of your work, stop it. If you think that the WhatsApping is actually going to give you uh, sleepless nights, you know, because you know you're constantly addicted to it and you can't work, stop it. That's how relationships actually uh, be become enhanced. Instead of looking at your social media, look at your partner, isn't it? How nice. So, most of the Partners, actually, generally speaking, they say my partner doesn't talk to me. I don't talk to my partner. Why? Because we are busy talking to other people's partners, <laughs> talking WhatsApp, social media, all these things. Yeah, even though we are not physically going and visiting them, but we are having a mighty good time. Uh, you know, talking to other people at the expense of, of our own children, of our own family members, our parents, brothers, sisters. All of them need our time. So this, that's why the Buddha, we have to look at the fifth precept in a very beautiful way and understand that the fifth precept is actually not about thou shall not drink. It's about when you drink, you break all the other precepts. When you drink, then you, you may actually, you know, be tempted to touch somebody who's not, you're not supposed to touch. You're tempted to steal. You, 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 you get so angry and enraged because your mind is clouded that you can kill. And then you can, you can and you tell all sorts of, uh, you, you, your speech becomes very unpleasant, yeah, at that time. And, people, and then so it's like, this is the reason why you should not actually drink alcohol and you should not actually cloud your mind. Because once you take any kind of substance that clouds your mind, then you can forget about Dharma practice. So usually people say that I go to the doctor, you know, because I'm having, a, a, like they go to a psychiatrist and then the psychiatrist gives them psychedelic drugs. The drugs only work on the, from, to give you a little bit of stability in your brain. It actually helps you to become less depressed for a short period of time because it gives you a bit of a feel-good boost. That is only working on the neurological pathways. That means your brain, your physical brain, you know. And once, and alcohol is the same. Alcohol is nice. You take alcohol, you love it. It makes you high. You get relaxed and spaced out, and you get a high for how long? Then the next day, the whole day, you get a headache. So for instant gratification, for a short period of gratification, then you have the next day full of uh, hangovers and this and that. Yeah, I know what I'm talking about. I I I have drank alcohol before and, and got pissed drunk myself yeah but so it's not that i'm i'm, I'm born a monk yeah i also have lived <laughs> i'm 46 years old going to be so i i know what i'm talking about and when i say that alcohol is bad news it's bad news yeah because it just fogs causes brain fog and then for those of us who take psychedelic drugs i mean some of us we have to yeah at that particular time but if we get too dependent on it then our brains are going to be foggy all the time we can't practice the dharma and for those of us who take refuge in in lsd and other marijuana you know uh, heroin all these kinds of drugs just because we are depressed then we are actually creating the causes to die faster and to completely uh completely ruin our health that means our minds can become a psychotic yeah so and we and it's irreversible damage once we take drugs somehow or other our neurological pathways get damaged and then, and then we, we, we actually are stuck. So this is the reason why the Buddha said, no, don't take anything that can actually uh, be mindful of what you consume. So what, be, be mind, mindful of what you consume before it consumes you. So alcohol can consume you. Drugs can consume you. Pornography can consume you. Games can consume you. Uh, social media can consume you. So, so you stop consuming it before it consumes you. That is the basic precept. Five, the five precepts you have to keep. Once you keep the five precepts, now you can you, you tell me after two or three years keeping the five precepts, do, I'm sure that your relationships will improve. Yeah? Your finances will improve. Your health also will improve because you're not actually uh, injecting poison into your uh, bloodstream. Yeah? By, and also not de destroying your liver. And you, in your smoke, you're actually uh, causing cancer to yourself and secondary smoke causes others to die also. So you actually 
you know, are of no benefit your actions to anybody in this world, isn't it? So that is the five precepts. Five precepts is sila. And then above the five precepts, we have concentration. So once you keep your five precepts very well, then you can concentrate very nicely. And if you have relationship problems, even if you create, if you keep these five precepts very nicely, meditate. Meditate for one hour each day. Yeah. And then above that is uh, right my uh, sorry, what is that called? Uh, right thought and right uh, intention. So this actually comes under the uh, pragya. That means prajna, uh, panya, wisdom. So we have got ethics, concentration and wisdom. This is the Noble Eightfold Path. So dependent origination. So this is how your mind works. Because ignorance means that we have no idea what we are doing. Until someone comes and points it out to us, we actually are in automatic mode. So because of ignorance, then we create fabrication. Fabrication means actually karmas. Yeah? So from karmas, we create consciousness. From consciousness, we create the five aggregates. We actually are just made up of five aggregates. We are, there is no truly existing being. The reality of our, our, nat our nature of, of our body and our existence is that we exist depending on causes and conditions. And these are the causes and conditions that bring us back into samsara again and again. So name and form meaning, uh, form meaning your rupa, your which is made of your five, uh, your panjata which is your five uh, elements, yeah, earth, water, fire, wind, space. So then after that you have got your feelings, your perception, then your mental formations, and then your uh, consciousness. So that is five aggregates, and then from five aggregates come your six sense bases: eye, ear, nose, tongue, uh, body, mind, and these are the things that project outwards. So you, you tend not to keep your morality because then tantalizing things come, you grab. Things that you don't like, you hate. So this is the reason why we're grabbing and pushing, pushing and pulling, everything actually is inside here. These three poisons, we are slaves to these three poisons. Whatever we like, we grab. Whatever we don't like, we push. So we are inevitably going to be in samsara for a long, long period of time. So our sixth sense project outwards, including our mental sense also. So five Indra and one mind. So five plus one. So we project it outwards. Whatever we like, we grab. Nice sound, we grab. Nice sights, we grab. So that's why we cannot stay at home during this, uh, this uh, pandemic. We all must go out, you know, because our, our unless you have got something very important that you work and anything, groceries and all, why do we need to go out for social functions? Why? You know? Because our six senses tell us that we must go out. Because an average human being, an, a sentient being, the, we are actually slaves to our senses. So we, whatever we hear, we must grab. Whatever we see, we must grab. So when, we, when something is nice going outside, we must go. So this is how the repercussions have come back to us now. So we created the karmas for this COVID-19 pandemic to be perpetually lingering around, you know, for the longest period of time. Until and unless we learn how to control our uh, faculties, you know. So how to control it? First, we have to understand what happens. Yeah. So it's five o'clock now. So just give me a couple of uh, minutes just to uh, wrap up. Yeah. So I just want to show you very, very quickly. So once your senses are going outwards, then whatever comes to in contact with your eye, ear, nose, tongue, mouth, uh, sorry, uh, uh, body and mind, whatever it is, whether it is the thoughts of the past, thoughts of the future, anything like that, all these things will create feelings. The next thing, feelings will come. Positive. I mean, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. So if you pleasant feeling, if you like that feeling, you will start to grab. And this craving is actually, I call it like attachment. You start to attach. And when your attachment is excessive, that you can't live without it, it becomes an obsession, then it's clinging. And once you start to cling at something, you create the causes for things to unfold. So if you look at your relationships and anything, if you cling to your relationship, if you cling to the idea that your partner is annoying or your partner is so beautiful or something like that, you, it's not healthy. Yeah? Or if you cling to your wealth and don't want to share, or if you cling to the idea that you always want to make more and more and more and more wealth, or if you cling to the idea that I'm poor, so you're just creating more causes to be poor. Stop creating. So if you know you're poor, then do something about it. First thing is, number one, acknowledge it. And number two, let it go. Acknowledge, let go. Acknowledge, let go. So if you have problems in your relationship, first you must understand whether you're keeping the five precepts or not. If you are keeping, then you must understand if anything else goes wrong, that means it must be some karmas ripening. So if there are karmas ripening, what to do? 
Number one, acknowledge that it is my karma that is happening because I have created this before. And then, number two, let go. That's all. And those and let go meaning don't say anything, don't think anything negative, don't say anything negative, and don't do anything negative, and then just let it be. Yeah? And then meditate daily, a little bit here and there. So when it becomes becoming, so when it becomes to becoming, then you have becoming creates birth. And then aging, death, and then suffering. So if you don't want to be in samsara, then you've got to go backwards. Yeah? So backwards, so this one, I don't have much time to talk to you about, but if you stop the birth, aging and death will stop. If you stop the becoming, birth will stop. So if you are not, if, you, if we die because we are born, isn't it? So if you don't want to die, don't want to become sick, then we don't have to be born. Stop the birth. That's what the Buddha says, stop it. And if you don't want to be born, then we have to stop the causes for becoming. And becoming is not only born. Daily, many situations are born. Situations, fights are born. You know, fights are created. Bhava means created, um, like creating, you know, something like becoming, creation. So every day, because we are projecting our senses outwards, we are creating, 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 creating. So when, when, the, when things like nice sounds, nice smell, anything, whatever feelings that we have, at this point, at the point of the feeling, whenever we have a pleasant feeling, unpleasant feeling, neutral feeling, don't grab it because our mind does only four things it goes into the past it goes into the future whatever is pleasant we grab whatever is unpleasant we push and because of that we start to cling and when we cling we, 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 we create the causes for more and more and more suffering and this is applicable once you understand this process it's applicable to your relationships it's applicable to your health it's applicable to your finances so the thing is, is that where do your thoughts belong? You tell me. So with this, I would like to uh, pass the baton back to uh, Sister Vinita uh, and also uh, Sister Jackie in case there are any questions. Time is short today, yeah? So that is all that I can offer. Thank you, Venerable. Yeah, sharing is very simple and we are able to understand. But I'd like to open this session for Q&A and Sister Jackie will be moderating it. She will check the questions. Uh, if there's any questions, you'd like to post it on chat or if you can just on, uh, un, uh, on your video and just raise your hand, uh, we will spot you and you can ask the question. We are open for questions. How much time do we have for questions, sister? Uh, 15 minutes. Okay. Looks like if we there... all understood your session. <laughs> Okay, then if uh, no, if there are no questions, so instead of uh, waiting for the questions, so let me just uh, very quickly share something with you all. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's uh, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, my colleague, have, uh, my colleague, Doctor Julia. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, when you have a question, how yes. can we bring our thoughts back to the present? Very good question. I was just about to share it with, uh, I, I was thinking of taking the five, uh, 15 minutes Q&A to do it. Yeah. So how to bring your mind into the present moment is to use the breath as your bridge. So you have to make sure that you, you breathe in, you're aware that you're breathing in, breathing out, I'm aware that I'm breathing out, in, out. So you do like this. So you block one nostril and then you breathe in through your right nostril. Breathing in, you tell yourself, I'm aware that I'm breathing in. And then you block the other nostril and then you breathe out and you say, breathing out, I'm aware that I'm breathing in, out, in. So being aware, being in the present moment, meaning that you need to be aware of your, first start with your breath through the pranayam. So when you do pranayam, breathing in, I'm aware that I'm breathing in, breathing out, I'm aware that I'm out. And then also put two, your hand, one right hand above your left hand, and then breathe in, I'm aware that I'm breathing in, breathing out, I'm aware that I'm breathing out, in, 
in. So after some time, your mind will start to, your conceptual thoughts will start to fizzle out because you're focused on one particular object, which is your breath. And then you feel that your breath becomes softer and softer, longer and longer, instead of being very tired. So when you first came in, you're, I'm sure like your, your breath is very like short. My breath was also a bit short, but now it's much, much, much longer and I'm more relaxed, yeah? How? Because I anchor my thought onto one thing. So mindfulness, being in the present moment, meaning that you can anchor your mind on one positive thing. For example, when the birds pass by, chirping of the birds, listen, listen, this wonderful uh, sound brings me back to my true nature. So if you see like a, a stream, and then you look at the stream, and then you are absorbed into the stream, and then you see, and then you say that the stream and I are one. We are not separate. The sound of the bird and I are one. And then when you and your breath become one, by observing the breath, observing the breath, you become one. At that particular time, you're, you are not in the past. Your thought is neither in the future. You are no more pushing and pulling. That means you're grasping at things that you like and pushing things that you don't like. So you're, when you're no longer in this realm and all your conceptual thoughts cease because you're focusing on one particular object and the object I encourage is use your breath. When you do that, definitely you'll be in the present moment. So uh, we Raven, have the questions uh, also. Yeah, yes. Raven, from the same uh, on, uh, second part of the question, uh, if we are at work wearing masks, so I mentally tell my mind I'm breathing in or out? We first have to start with some positive affirmation in our minds. Because our minds are, we have monkey minds, yeah? Our minds are unruly. It, it just goes all over the place. So it's very difficult to actually get our monkey mind to settle. So we need positive affirmations. We need to have an anchor. And what is that anchor? The anchor is your focus on your nostril, the tip of your nostril. And then... You tell yourself, breathing in, I'm aware that I'm breathing in, breathing out, I'm aware that I'm breathing out, without verbalizing, just in your mind. Breathing in, I'm aware that I'm breathing in, breathing out, I'm aware that I'm breathing out. And if if, if a, a thought of the past suddenly comes, gently bring your awareness back to your breath. If a thought of the future suddenly comes, gently bring your awareness back back to your breath. If suddenly you feel that your five senses are projecting somewhere, you need to go, you know, <laughs> gently release that thought, let go, and bring it. Bring your awareness back to your breath. And if you suddenly feel that your, your, something is unpleasant, you hear something not nice, like some sound or something, very irritating something, you say, then you, you, you are going to about, you're about to push it away and, 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 and latch on to that sound, just let go and bring your awareness back to your breath. So to answer your question, when you are in your office or wherever you are, when you do your pranayama, breathing in, breathing out, in, breathing out, you don't verbalize it. All you need to do is think in your mind and after some time, even that, you let go. That means you cannot be all the time positive, sending, uh, you know, having uh, this uh, mental affirmation because it tends to disturb you in the long run. Even that also you let go and you, your innate awareness and your breath becomes one. You get what I'm trying to say? You focus on your breath for a very long period of time until the, the separation between subject and object is completely dissolved. You become the breath and the breath becomes you. You become the bird and the bird becomes you. You become the stream and the stream becomes you. You become the, the sun, the, the setting sun, and the setting sun becomes you. So once you, when your mind is absorbed, fully absorbed into that object, at that time, your clear like sky-like nature of mind completely reveals itself. And at that particular time, are in samadhi. Samadhi meaning deep concentration. Okay, Reverend, you have few more here. Uh, first one. Here are certain people who committed big crimes but never but they never managed to get caught by the rules of law. Can we hmm. assume these people might have committed a did so good that they have so much good karma to the point where they are so lucky to not get caught by right now? 
You said it, yeah, so I don't think I need to say anything more. So you've, you've come up with your own conclusions. But having said that, having said that, yeah, just understand one thing about the law of karma. The law of karma says that, you know, you're never punished for what you didn't do. And, you know, and whatever that good that you have done, you will always receive the rewards. So if you do a very, so how does karma work? Let me, let me explain to you very, very, very important. Karma works on the basis of intention. Karma actually works from the mind, from the level. Like, for example, some uh, spiritual traditions like Jain says that uh, the Jains believe that the karma is actually only through your actions. So that's why they take great pains not to step on any living being, not to breathe in any bacteria, you know, and many other things. So they carry a water strainer around. So everything. So they're very, very conscious about their bodily actions. But the Buddha said that actually speaking, you should be more concerned about your mental actions. Mental actions meaning your thoughts. So what do we mean by that? Your intention. So if your intention is to benefit somebody, but you can only donate one ringgit, you know, to save, uh, to buy an oxygen concentrator for India, for example. But your motivation is so pure, in your future life, you probably will never be deprived of oxygen because, you, you know, and that also for thousands of lives. Even though you only donated one ringgit, but the intention, the motivation is very, very strong, right? But if your intention is, uh, like, for example, you think that you have done some very small little thing that is not really significant, but your intention is really, very malevolent, so, like, very bad intention to really be full of hatred, even the smallest act, like, for example, you kill a cockroach full of hatred, and I hate them. It's just one small little cockroach, but that intensity of your hatred will, will ensure that your karma karmic results get amplified leaps and bounds and this is not something that you need to believe work on it in the laboratory of your mind whether you believe in karma cause and effect it doesn't matter because those who go back to the laboratory of their minds they know whether there is karma and they know whether there is any rebirth or not if you're in school, for example, in a chemistry lesson, we are a biology lesson, we have to dissect cockroaches and that in order to look at their anatomy. And if we need to make certain chemicals in order to be able to verify, yes, you know, this is the color of a pungent, uh, like for example, uh, chlorine has this pungent smell. If you mix this and then you, you get, you know, you release chlorine, the pungent smell is there. So that is evidence. All these things are done in a laboratory, right? In the same way, whatever that you want to know about karma is done in the laboratory of your mind. You can actually check your mind and see. When you do the slightest bit of mistake, but with a very, very bad intention, you suffer mentally more than if you have done a very big mistake, but with uh, accidentally, that means unintentional. Everything is there. So for these uh, people, you know, who have, uh, you know, done a lot of bad in this lifetime, and then, and then they never seem to be getting caught. Well, one fine day, they will definitely have to suffer the, the, the repercussions of their action. And yes, there's another way to explain it also. For those of us who have done very, very good karma, so you have done, a, it's, like a big, uh, it's like a big stream and you put one particular drop of ink inside a big stream. The stream meaning that you have got plenty of good karma. The stream is the good karma. That one drop of ink is your bad karma. So the effect is not going to be very great, isn't it? If you put one drop of ink inside a glass of water, the entire glass of water becomes blue. And, it's really, and you can really see the repercussions of that action because of a limited amount of good karma. So you're right, yeah? You're absolutely right. These people have done tremendously good karma. That's why they are the leaders. <laughs> we haven't, so that's why we are the subjects. <laughs> okay, Raman, uh, question two. What if people don't want to communicate nicely, no matter how nicely we treat a person? What if this happens to someone for the majority of the people around you? Can we just attribute it to karma and accept it as there is a way to eradicate this bad karma? Yes, there's always a way to eradicate bad karma. The Buddha said that do good and what evil purify the mind. That is the basic teaching of the Buddha. So if you ask the Buddha, the Buddha said, I only taught you two things. Number one, how to, uh, what life is suffering and there is a way out of suffering, right? So if you are suffering, definitely there is a way out of suffering because that is the third noble truth. You cannot just say that you're suffering and leave it there and then there is no way that you can do anything about it. That's not true. 
So if your friends, if uh, you're ostracized by your family members, community, anything like that, then you need to go back to the laboratory of your mind and check your thought, thought waves. Yeah. So what sort of vibes are you sending out to the universe? Are you smiling? Are you uh, having uh, some kind of negativity and then a suspicious look? And are you projecting some positive vibes, meaning loving kindness, compassion, or are you projecting some sort of uh, suspicious vibes, something that is not very pleasant and people pick it up, you know, and people don't want to come near you. So you have to check up. And if you feel that you're a very fairly positive person and people still don't want to come near you, then number one, you should always accept it as a previous karma that is ripening, right? You can't do anything. You can't go around kissing people, isn't it? So but what you can do and you can't, of course, you can't go asking people to pat your back also and say, oh, yeah, you know, uh, Dr. Karma is a very, very good person. Nobody is going to come and say that. Yeah, I think it's very rare, isn't it? Uh, so the thing is just what we have to do is we have to um, practice loving kindness and compassion. So for these kinds of situations, it's because of a mental defilement called anger in the past. We have done a lot of karma, uh, creating a lot of negativity through anger. So this anger will actually ripen in, in, you know, very often. People will not like us. We'll have a lot of problems. So what we can do, we there is an antidote to anger. The antidote to anger is called loving kindness and compassion, metta. So what you can do, take your right hand, put it on your, on your heart center, and then you tell yourself, may my heart be peaceful and free. May my heart be peaceful and free. May my mind be happy. May my mind be happy. May my body be healthy. May my body be healthy. May I be well and happy. May I be well and happy. So you breathe in this beautiful bright light from the universe. Beautiful bright light. And then you send that light. So when you say that, may my heart be peaceful and free. You breathe in that beautiful bright light. And then that light goes down enters your nostril and then goes down until your heart center and then it spreads to your heart. So if you have got like a heart that is closed and you're because of some bad relationships in the past, you don't want to open up, this will cause you to open up. So you tell yourself first, love yourself first. Maybe that's why others don't want to love you because they know that you might not love yourself. So metta is very important. Metta means that you start loving yourself, loving kindness. So breathe in this beautiful bright light from the universe and then the light goes into your nostril and then it goes to your heart center and then you tell yourself, may my heart be peaceful and free. May my heart be peaceful and free. And then once again, you breathe in this beautiful bright light of the universe and then you say, may my mind be happy. So send it to your brain. Sometimes you're very tired, too many things and if we don't, we project a lot of negativity also. So may my mind be happy. May my mind be happy. And at the same time, release all the negativities in the form of black smoke. So we purify our own negativities. Breathe in, beautiful bright light, healing energy of the universe. Breathing out, we breathe out these negative black karmas in the form of black smoke. So breathe in, I, may my heart be peaceful and free. And then breathe out all these negativities in the form of black smoke. And then breathe in once again, may my mind be happy. So breathe in this beautiful bright light. And then release, you know, all the negativities from your brain, your tiredness. Say, may my mind be happy. And then third, once again, breathe in this beautiful bright light. And then you tell yourself, may my body be healthy. So this is how you actually uh, be victor uh, you are victorious over relationships and your health. You heal yourself through loving kindness and compassion. So may my body be healthy. And then may I be well and happy. Then you send that beautiful bright light to the whole body. Whole body. So you heal yourself first and foremost, right? Which any relationship in this world, if you want to work on it, first work on yourself, right? And then you send this beautiful loving kindness energy to everybody. First start with somebody that you love very much. So you send this beautiful energy to somebody that you love. Say, may your heart be peaceful and free. May your mind be happy. May your body be healthy. May you be well and happy. Then after that, you send it to somebody that is neutral in the street. And then after that, you send it to somebody that you are not very, not very good. Yeah? Your relationship is not so good. 
you send it to that person say may your heart be peaceful and free whoever it is who you know i must i must have done something wrong to you in the past otherwise you will not be doing this to me anyway may your heart be peaceful and free may your mind be happy may your body be healthy may you be well and happy after you have done this then you expand to your neighborhood your whole family your neighborhood uh, your district and kl or wherever you are and then your country and then the whole world and then the whole universe just burst this beautiful bright light just spread it across the world that is called projecting beautiful energy and when you do that daily and many times a day nobody can actually eat. the moment people come and see you they just want to talk to you you completely change your energy trust me if it doesn't work come and see me any other question yeah the uh, question 3 there are many rituals mantra charms etc that claims to cleanse past lives karma how do we know which actually work today uh if i understand the question clearly jackie is uh, asking about all these different practices rituals, and all the meant to meant to uh re- purify the negative karma they are asking yes. whether can or not yes depends on on your concentration and your motivation if your motivation is to use these practices to tame your mind definitely it will have a, be- a benefit and the reason why it has benefit because when you chant a mantra whatever practice that you do dharma practice that you do with is like in any spiritual tradition whether in buddhism we say we are chanting mantras or we are doing meditation or in in other religions we say we are doing bhajan kirtan we are doing pat whatever you know dip, you know reading the scriptures doing seva you know all these things if you are doing it with a very good motivation in service of humanity yes your negative karmas will be purified that's for sure because you are projecting your you are actually stopping from actually clinging to your own selfish self you are actually putting somebody above yourself and and that's called bodhicitta in, in mahayana buddhism bodhicitta meaning that you are working to benefit others and bodhicitta has the ability to purify negative karmas because you stop thinking about yourself and then you reduce your selfishness for people who keep on thinking only about themselves me myself and i my 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 these are the people who will always remain in perpetual misery financial trouble and relationship trouble until and unless we learn how to cherish other people and work for the benefit of others then only our fortunes will change so coming back to the mantra and everything whatever dharma practice that you do whichever spiritual tradition that you are in right that you belong to or if you don't belong to it doesn't matter whatever that you do make sure that you do it with full concentration so if you're chanting a mantra with full concentration that means your body your mind and your mouth are co- are one right so if you're reading the scriptures your mind and your mouth become one so if you're doing breathing in breathing out practice your mind and your breath becomes one if you're looking at a stream your mind and the stream becomes one if you're looking at sunset your mind and the sunset becomes one so how is it how does it purify your negative karmas number one it stops from creating more negative karmas because you're no longer in the past you're no longer in the future and at that particular time you're not clinging and then you're not pushing you're not creating any negative karma and then once you are creating and then you you create positive karma because you actually are doing it for the benefit of others if you're only doing it for your own selfish benefit you create very little karma good karma but if you're doing it for the benefit of others you create mountain infinite karma good karma and that is how you purify all your negative karma so any dharma practice mantra la prostrations la whatever la you can do as long as you do it for the motivation to benefit all sentient beings and also do it with full concentration then definitely it will purify you because your why it's so simple because your mind is not going to the past future and like and dislike and then you are shifting the 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 uh, the focus from this puny little self you know selfish little self me me my 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 all the time self grasping self grasping and cherishing no wonder we are having bad karmas no wonder we are miserable try for once doing something genuinely for others without expecting anything in return that is the day all inactive karmas will clear 100% genuine next 
request dia. Everyone, there's a request. Ah, uh, uh, dear venerable, could you kindly share the link of today's recording in YouTube so that my mom can view and listen? Thank you. Okay, I would like to request that uh, person to uh to to drop me an email or to drop any of the organizers an email or you know, uh, my my email is here. This is my email. So can you share? Uh, Oh, this is my email. The text, yeah. So I, I'm not sure whether uh, the Sukan Dharma School email is there, but my email is here. Kindly email me and then I will send you the uh, YouTube video. Uh, when I'm not to say YouTube, la, it, it, I will send you the link. When I have time, you can put it on YouTube. Otherwise, Sukan Dharma School, I request you all to put on YouTube and send me the link. Also can. You do that, Venerable. I'll yeah. get the IT team to assist right. yeah. And then, uh, any other questions? Just now, Reverend, just now there's a Dr. Julia, is it? I can't her cue. Huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Dr. I'm Julia here. was supposed to ask the question. That's why I was wondering whether uh, she wrote it instead or okay. Hi, Julia. How are you? Uh, let me see uh, if my camera is working. I don't know if my camera is working or not, but um, that's not important. Um, I actually, I'm doing something for the first time in my life. Uh, I usually never do this. Uh, I only turn on or raise my hand when I have a question to ask. But today, I don't really have a question to ask. I just wanted to say these words of gratitude to you, Karma, for today's talk. It's my first time attending any of your talks. And um, I'm Dr. Karma's uh, colleague. And uh, usually I see her Office in... Mate. <laughs> a little bit different office made also and I'm, I'm very proud of it i always tell my mom and my family about you uh, but i usually know and see uh karma in a very professional capacity and today i got a chance to have this sneak peek to her underlying layers that form the sense of peace that uh, she apparently experiences herself and also radiates onto the others um, and um, beyond my morning for today that uh, none of us can uh, participate in the, this procession, in this demonstration that uh, annually is held for the WISAC day. I used to enjoy them very much uh, whenever I had a chance to attend, um, almost every year. I just wanted to say how much I'm grateful to you for your today's talk and for the invitation. It, it is so good and so refreshing. Thank you so much, Karma. Thank you, Julia. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, for once, we are communicating uh, apart from work <gasps> and study. Yeah. Julia and I'm is so also glad to do this. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. And we will definitely have the parade next year if we stop projecting our senses outwards, follow all the SOPs. <sighs> we'll, Julia and I will be back on the parade. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, thank sure. you so much, Julia. And thank you so much for your questions. So um, um, I think we are running out of time, isn't it? Yeah, so we need time back to you. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Venerable. Thank you very much for your sharing. Like uh, Julia mentioned, um, you have given us very uh, lots of nuggets of information that we can use in our daily practices and also during this current pandemic. And I'm very uh, blessed to be associated with you and to learn from you and I think we all are learning from each other. So thank you very much for that. And I'd like to share a few uh, information if y'all can just spare some details because we'll have another session with one of the doctors again. So uh, I'll ask Sister Rooney to share the screen. Uh, wherever, uh, if you can. Yes, I stopped sharing. Ah, Correct. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, we'll have another session on the 30th of May. Uh, please join us again. We will 
Sister Jackie will share the link with Venerable Karma. And here we are going to discuss on the value of good speech. Uh, we are inviting Venerable Dr. Tenzin Danon Sonam uh, to come in and share this session with you. Uh, actually, I've projected it for uh, young kids, but uh, please, um, you are most welcome to come in. I think uh, we all need to learn the value of good speech. Um, but if you like to, you can please um, invite your children or your grandchildren to come in. We'll have the session from 10 to 12. I will share the link with uh, Honorable Dr. Karma so that she can also share with her community. And uh, please come in. We are having this session. This is the uh, going to be our final session because we have actually dedicated the whole month of May uh, for WISAP and uh, Venerable uh, Sonam coming in would be uh, the conclusion for our month-long uh, series of WISAP activities that we have uh, conducted in Tiratana organization as well as Sutadama School. Um, and before we end, I would like to invite Venerable again. Minita, Minita. Yes. Inform, inform them the 7.30 uh, chief closing, uh, they can continue to watch in Facebook and YouTube. Okay, uh, before this closing chat, I'd like to share with you that uh, T. Ratana will be having the closing ceremony for WESAP 2021 and Chief Reverend uh, will be with us. So please join us again on the same link that we you have been viewing us from this morning. Uh, and uh, we will actually conclude the WESAP 2021 with Chief at 7.30 today. Um, but before that, uh, we will like to invite Venerable Kama again to do a closing chant as well as sharing merits because we need to bless Malaysia and the world as we all need a lot of peace, healing and order. So I would like to invite Venerable Kama again to do this um, closing chant as well as sharing merits uh, before we conclude today's session. Thank you, Venerable. I put my palms together and say thank you so very much to join us and to give you all, give us all this information and the opportunity to meet you again. And we will definitely be in touch with you so that we will continue to be learning with you. Okay, thank you, Venerable. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sister Vinita. So um, we have come to the end of our talk and I would like to um, acknowledge, I would like to uh, first and foremost uh, thank uh, T. Ratana Sukha Dhamma School, headed by uh, Chief Venerable Dr. K. Sri Dhamma Ratana Nayaka Mahathera, founder and spiritual advisor of T. Ratana, and also Sukha Dhamma School, Venerable H. Hema Lokatera, who is the spiritual advisor of Sukha Dhamma School. Without these two venerables, I wouldn't be here today. And also without the dedication of Sister Vinita uh, and her tears, they have been working so hard over the past one month. So I'm really, really indebted to all of them. And they have not only worked so hard to uh, get this talk, uh, which is actually the last uh, talk for, but of course now you have mentioned that Venerable Sonam's uh, talk will be the last. So today, there's still a lot of good coming in, so it's not the last after all. Um, the Sukha Dharma School has done a marvelous job in terms of uh, uniting the three traditions. So from this morning, they had uh, the chanting in Pali, Theravada tradition, and they also had the chanting in Mahayana tradition uh, by Mahayana Sangha. So, uh, and now we have got the Tibetan tradition, the Vajrayana Sangha. So Sukha Dharma School is really uh, true to the spirit of one Buddhism and, and humanity is just one year. So, uh, so we, I'm really, really very uh, touched that uh, all, you have given equal opportunity to all the Sanghas of all the different traditions uh, to share and be with the devotees on this very auspicious day of Vesak. So, and I commend and thank all volunteers from the bottom of all of you have worked very hard, the IT team, the teachers, uh, those who have arranged the offerings, uh, those who have uh, been in every capacity. I could not join you, so I, I do not know who you are uh, this year, but from what I know from the previous years, all of you have actually really worked very, very hard and um, 
and I'm sure that you have had many sleepless nights and also yesterday the National Security Council did not allow uh, the pre Vesa uh, day celebrations on a Saturday. So you all had to shift it to 6 a.m. in the morning. Such great dedication. Uh, and you packed everything into one day, even though you have had many other activities in the whole of the month. So it's, um, let us take it as uh, a ripening of all our karmas. Yeah? So we, have, we are in this world, uh, we, we are born in this age and time, and especially in the human body, we all have some sort of a karmic connection with each other. Otherwise, we won't be here today. And if you do not have the karma to listen to this uh, dharma sharing, you wouldn't be here today either. So you do have the karma. And uh, let us make sure that uh, we do not despair in times of COVID-19. And I would also like to thank all uh, brothers and sisters in the dharma from all the various spiritual traditions, my family members. I see my cousin brother and my sister-in-law. Thank you so much, Asbil, and also uh, Dar. You very much and also my cousin sister in uh, India and many other uh, friends my dear friends and also uh, new friends whom I've never met and I hope to meet you all after uh, this COVID-19 so I just want to thank you bottom of my heart for listening to me and I just want you all to know that uh, I do not have any particular uh, realization I'm the least bit qualified teach the dharma but whatever i say is actually coming from uh, my teacher the historical siddhartha book so uh, whatever mistakes that i have made today is all mine and whatever benefit that you have got i attribute it and dedicate it back uh, to my teacher siddhartha gotham both and also to all my teachers uh, from small until now whether they are spiritual teachers or mundane teachers uh, teaching me the alphabet, including my own parents, teaching me how to walk. Today is the day I take this opportunity to really thank them from the bottom of my heart for giving me the opportunity, the human birth and uh, education and every opportunity to be able to sit here in front of you, healthy, relatively healthy, alive, and uh, with some ability to expound the Dharma. So, uh, I, it's a day of gratitude, yeah, I can't say anything more. So in order to channel this gratitude to the correct place and to all sentient beings who are suffering, I would like to uh, do some dedication in, uh, in uh, Tibetan. So for family members, friends, or from different spiritual traditions, you can just visualize that you're dedicating it in your own spiritual tradition to all sentient beings. Because it's like uh, in Sikhism, we say Sarbata Dapala. So it's like for everybody's benefit. It's not only for our own benefit. Nothing that we do in this world should be only for our own benefit. If we do that, it's very small karma, very little. But the moment we do something very small, but with a great motivation for everybody's benefit, then that comes vast amounts of good karma. So even if sitting on your couch daily and just doing one chanting, one prayer, but for the benefit of sentient beings, is already creating a lot of so don't worry if you can't go out, you can't attend Vesa, you can't attend any functions. Don't worry. Sit at home, follow the SOPs and dedicate it for the benefit of all sentient beings. So how to dedicate? Let me just very quickly share with you. You dedicate it so that all sentient beings will be free from ignorance. The root, agyanta, you know, agyanta, avidya. So the root of samsara is agyanta. So agyanta, uh, ignorance transforms into attachment and hatred. And because of that, we are circling round and round recycled in samsara. So what should we do? We should actually dedicate to all sentient beings that their agyanta, their uh, ignorance is completely, is completely purified. And all sentient beings' ignorance is completely purified because once it's purified, then they stop doing negative karmas. When you stop doing negative karmas, then people stop suffering. And once people stop suffering, then whole, the whole world becomes peaceful and harmonious. So that's the correct way to dedicate, yeah? So uh, please forgive me if, if you don't understand Tibetan, but just enjoy the chanting. Sunam di tam chit zi kwa Ni tam ni ni pe dra nam pam ji ni Ta na chi ba la pru it's it 
ชาวบ้านเดินทะเวลามาริมเจดากิจิวเปเมเดชุปาตรินชินปุเตจิสุมสุนทุกิงรุจาดุสุปาเดนลามิปาราทาร์ปาลากิจิกสามยังรุกาม
Happy Sakadawa. Ah, thank you. Greeting in Tibetan, nice. Thanks. Tashidele. <laughs> Tashidele, Tashidele. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Happy Vesak, everyone. Happy Vesak. Bye. Please join us at 7.30. Thank you. The same channel. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. Bye.